Yeah. Hello. Hi. This, uh, in this session, we're going to be talking about uh, causes of non-cardiac chest pain. Um, so, to begin with, the objectives are we should identify the non-cardiac causes of uh, chest pain, what could be causing them, how presentation classically uh, would be, uh, what we can find uh, on examination, uh, what investigations we should be uh, trying to uh, request, and how we can manage the uh, patient initially. So, to start off, what's in the chest? You have the, the heart, you have the lungs, you have the cavities covering them, you have the esophagus coming uh, down, passing through the chest, uh, you have the great vessels. And with those, you also have what covers the chest. There are multiple reasons to have chest pain, some cardiac, some none, and today we said we're going to be talking about the non-cardiac causes. So, how do we take pain history? What do we ask? The easier mnemonic is Socrates. So, it's sight. Where is the pain? And then we talk about the onset. When did it start? How did it start? How can they describe the pain? And remember, sharp sometimes mean different things. So try to investigate if the patient says it's sharp. Ask the patient what they mean by the word sharp. There's also the radiation. Is the pain only in one place or does it go to other places? We move on to, are there any other symptoms happening with the pain? And then we said, what time the pain started? And then what makes the pain better or goes away and what makes it worse? What brings it on? And then how bad is the pain on a scale of one to 10? One being the very minimal pain, 10 being the worst pain ever and if they've had any previous similar episodes. First thing we're going to talk about is pulmonary embolism or what we call PE. This is the blockage of the arterial supply to the lungs. Um, there are many disposing, predisposing factors to that. Um, we're talking about the elderly, someone with sepsis, someone with uh, cancer, someone with previous uh, uh, DVTs or PEs, uh, someone with uh, COPD. Um, other causes can be the long, uh, long lying down or uh, re recent surgeries if they've had a long-haul flight, um, even something like uh, being on the um, uh, oral contraceptive pills. The mortality rate is significant. So mortality rate is around 7% for those that are diagnosed and treated, let alone those who are undiagnosed. Um, history is usually uh, someone would present to you uh, saying that they're feeling uh, short of breath, they have chest pain that is pleuritic in nature, some would say that they were coughing up blood, uh, some would actually just collapse, uh, they might look a little bit cyanotic, they might even come in a, in a cardiac arrest. Um, you examine them, you might notice that the heart rate is elevated above 100. They might be tachypnic. Uh, they might have a low-grade fever. Uh, you need to check the oxygen uh, saturations. Uh, check the blood pressure because uh, they might be hypotensive in a massive PE. 
um, you need to do a full respiratory and cardiovascular examination and don't forget to check for signs of for DVT. This is a, um, uh, an image of a CTPA, uh, which is the um, definite diagnosis for a PE. And you can see where the arrow is. It shows the, uh, the part where the embolus is. How do we treat? So that depends on uh, the size or severity of the, uh, the embolus, the hemodynamic stability or instability of the patient. Um, but it is, um, we can start with the noxaparin, currently as the current guidelines. Uh, if there is hemodynamic instability, alteplase uh, in various uh, doses depending on the condition. Talking about another cause of chest pain, which is common, uh, that's pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia is responsible for uh, one-sixth of deaths in the US. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have um, uh, any um, statistics about the UK. Um, the problem is that the lungs are vulnerable to infections despite having immune and non-immune mechanisms uh, of defense. The microbes are readily uh, inhaled into the lungs. Uh, you aspirate a normal uh, nasopharyngeal uh, flora, uh, possibly during your sleep. If there is any lung disease, lowering the immunity makes them more predisposed to infection. Also, the lifestyle habits have an effect on that, so let's not forget that smoking compromises the mucociliary clearance and affects the macrophages activities. Um, alcohol uh, consumption also impairs neutrophil functions, uh, impairs cough and the epiglottic reflex. So, we can classify pneumonia into community acquired. So community acquired would either be bacterial uh, or viral. Uh, we can uh, also, another classification would be the, or another, another category in the classification would be the hospital acquired pneumonias. Uh, there's also the aspiration pneumonia, chronic pneumonias, necrotizing pneumonia and pneumonia is in an immunocompromised uh, subject. Uh, we can also uh, we can also uh, classify pneumonia according to the morphology. So it could be a bronchial pneumonia, it could be lobar pneumonia or interstitial pneumonia. Clinical picture of a pneumonia. So it's an infection. So they come in with fever cough, possibly productive cough. Uh, they might have, uh, feel a little bit breathless. They might have the chest pain. Uh, they might have a bit of uh, bony ache. Um, they might even have hemopsis. Um, and you might not even find a localizing sign to the chest. Um, they might have respiratory distress that is out of proportion to the uh, clinical findings or the radiological findings and always be weary of the elderly they can present in different ways so you have to look for it on examination you do your full assessment make sure uh, you you check the respiratory rate the oxygen saturation the blood pressure the pulse uh, you auscultate look for any inspiratory crackles and don't forget uh, that it could be related to sepsis and i think we'll talk about that on another talk uh, so, for investigations, you need the basics, you need the full blood count, 
you need to use an ease, you can uh, check the CRP, uh, you can do blood cultures uh, if it is indicated, you can also do sputum cultures, um, a chest x-ray is also important, uh, you might need to do an arterial blood gas if the uh, oxygen saturations are below what is expected. Um, there could be plenty of other investigations to make sure you're not focusing only on pneumonia when something else is happening. Um, and if you're suspecting sepsis, make sure you, do, you uh, obtain a venous blood gas, at least to check the lactate and always think sepsis 6. So for treatment, treatment, think clinical picture, also think CURB 65, made up of uh, new onset confusion or worsening confusion, uh, urea level above 7, um, a respiratory rate above 30, and uh, blood pressure below systolic, uh, below 90 systolic, and of course the age of 65. Our current guidelines, our trust uh, guidelines, suggest that if the curve 65 is zero, consider discharge. Uh, if it's one to two, consider uh, admission. Three to four, you admit the patient. And this is uh, the current advice for treatment. So if you're admitting the patient, unless the patient uh, is allergic uh, to penicillin, then you give coamoxiclav uh, 1.2 grams IV, that's TDS, and azithromycin 500 milligrams uh, orally uh, tw uh, once daily. Uh, there are also alternatives to the treatment. If you're considering discharge, the current guidelines suggest uh, amoxicillin uh, one gram um, orally three times a day for five days or doxycycline 200 milligrams once daily for all for five days. Moving on to another cause of chest pain. This one is pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is the presence of air in the pleural sac. Uh, can be classified as primary or secondary. Primary is usually in young, healthy, or apparently healthy adults. More uh, men with no known pulmonary disease. Secondary is a result of uh, thoracic or lung disorder could be emphysema, could be uh, fractured ribs, uh, consequence of rupture of any pulmonary lesion close to the pleural surface would cause the pneumothorax. These lesions include uh, emphysema, uh, lung abscess, TB, uh, carcinoma. So how do, do the patients present? They present with unilateral pleuritic chest pain with dyspnea, their uh, uh, respiratory rate is uh, a little bit elevated, they might be tachycardic, you might even uh, feel, no, notice reduced air entry on the affected side. One particular uh, type of pneumothorax that we have to be uh, uh, always aware of is the tension pneumothorax where the, uh, their, the patient comes in, they, they're unable to speak, uh, they have low uh, oxygen saturations, they might be hypotensive, uh, you might even find some tracheal deviation. Uh, this is an emergency that needs urgent management. So on this chest x-ray you can uh, see um, the uh, pleural white line on the right side that shows you the, uh, the pneumothorax and you can see the lung uh, marking just retracted to the, um, to the middle of the chest. 
and this is another uh, slide showing the tracheal deviation in a tension pneumothorax. CT uh, scanning can also provide um, uh, good uh, imaging and can quantify how big the pneumothorax is. Um, okay, so how do we manage? So let's monitor the patient, get IV access, give uh, oxygen, and we should follow the BTS guidelines. So, uh, I've kind of crammed the guidelines into one slide, so we'll go through that. Um, first of all, it's talking about measurements. So, we measure from the hilum, the size of the pneumothorax, you measure it from the hilum in centimeters. If uh, it's bilateral uh, and you see hemodynamic instability, proceed immediately to chest drains. That's if you have a confirmed pneumothorax on a chest x-ray. Now, apart from that, let's go back to the original classifications of primary and secondary pneumothorax. So if it's a primary pneumothorax and we've measured the pneumothorax uh, at the hilum, and it's less than two centimeters and the patient is not breathless, then you can uh, observe uh, for uh, uh, just a short amount of time, discharge the patient with advice and a follow-up. The follow-up will be discussed later. Um, if the size of the pneumothorax is more than two centimeters or there is breathlessness, then you proceed to aspirate and then after aspiration, you uh, repeat the chest x-ray. On repeating the chest x-ray, if the size is still more than two centimeters or there is breathlessness, consider doing a chest drain and admit the patient. If it has resolved or become less than two centimeters and has, uh, the patient uh, has improved and there's no uh, longer um, any breathlessness, then you can consider a discharge with advice and uh, a follow-up plan. Now, in a secondary pneumothorax, that's where the patient is older than 50, is a smoker, or there is an underlying lung disease. If the size is uh, more than two centimeters or there is breathlessness, move on to a chest drain and admit the patient. If the size is less than two centimeters but no breath and no breathlessness, admit the patient for high flow and observations. So uh, secondary uh, pneumothorax, you're admitting the patient. Primary, there is a chance you are discharging the patient with a follow-up or you might attempt aspiration or inserting a chest drain. Now, Let's make sure that we do not forget that we have to consent the patient. We have to explain the procedure, what the, why we're doing the procedure, what the risks, the, current, the, the common and the serious risks um, with that. If we're discharging the patient, uh, we have to advise the patient that they should avoid flying. Uh, until at least one week after a confirmed uh, resolution on a chest x-ray. They should avoid, uh, avoid uh, diving and that's lifelong. Uh, if they smoke, we should offer them smoking cessation advice and we should tell them that they should return to the emergency department if the symptoms reoccur. Another cause of uh, chest pain uh, would be the aortic dissection, which is the uh, longitudinal splitting of the muscle, uh, the muscular aorta uh, by a column of blood. If we look at the diagram here, this is a normal uh, lumen of an uh, aorta, and here you can see the tear in the, or in the media 
uh, with blood forming inside or going inside. Um, it can spread either proximally, so can cause uh, cardiac uh, compromise, or distally and involve other uh, um, arteries, or it can rupture. Risk factors for aortic uh, dissection would be hypertension or someone with a connective tissue disorder uh, such as Marfan's uh, or Eller Danlos, uh, someone who's had a uh, cardiac surgery recently, an angiography or an angioplasty. Uh, it's even although rare, uh, it was found to happen in pregnancy in the third trimester uh, and afterwards. Uh, this is just a diagram to show you the aorta. Notice the um, from the origin you have the brachiocephalic artery and then you have the left common carotid and the left subclavian and then it goes into the descending aorta uh, and this helps us later on with the classification. There are a couple of um, classifications around so Stanford classification uh, is based on the involvement of the part of the, uh, the aorta, the ascending aorta. So if it is uh, the proximal aorta, uh, this is called Stanford A. Uh, if it's after the left subclavian, uh, then it's a Stanford B. And this helps with management. Okay, how would they present? Again, it's pain. Pain is sudden onset, it's excruciating. It's tearing or stabbing. Uh, usually starts anterior of the chest wall and then radiates to the back between the scapulae, uh, moving downwards depending on the extension of the, uh, the dissection. Some patients, about 10%, would present with syncope uh, can come up as uh, a different type of presentation. Some patients present as a, a myocardial infarction, um, depending on the extension of the dissection, uh, they can come up in various uh, presentations, including some neurologic deficits. On examination, you find that the patient is distressed. You can't really alleviate the pain. Um, uh, peripheral pulses might be asymmetrical or even absent. He, the patient might be hypotensive or hypertensive. Uh, you might find uh, some neurological signs uh, if the spinal or carotid arteries are involved. For investigations, uh, we of course just get a uh, secure, uh, good IV axis, get a uh, full blood count, they use an ease coagulation screen, make sure you cross match and let the blood bank aware of that. You get ECG, uh, you might see evidence of myocardial infarction, uh, LVH or ischemia. Uh, Obtain a chest x-ray, chest x-ray you might see the widening of the mediastinum, uh, the aorta uh, with a double knuckle, some would have left sided pleural effusion, uh, you might notice a deviation of the trachea in some of the patients. There is also the calcium sign which shows a uh, separation of two parts of the aorta by a calcified uh, aorta. The definite investigation is a CTA uh, and in the image here if you notice where the uh, red arrows that's where the, um, the dissection is occurring. Um, if we think of the management as we said before we should obtain good IV access so two wide bore cannulae, uh, give uh, oxygen uh, make sure you've cross-matched six units, uh, informed the blood bank, uh, give uh, adequate analgesia 
and uh, emergency cardiothoracic input. They'll tell you about the blood pressure control, which is very important to management, and if they require transfer to their site. Um, type 1, which is as we said, is in the ascending aorta, uh, is usually surgically uh, managed, but it does have a high mortality rate that approaches around 70% uh, if associated with distal ischemia. Um, type B is usually medically managed uh, and there is a good 75% survival rate but the 10-year survival rate is um, I think around 40%. We don't get to see this that often but we should always keep that in mind. Um, rupture of the esophagus is also one of the causes of uh, chest pain. This could be traumatic, which is uncommon. It follows blunt or penetrating uh, injury to the chest, uh, or the Borhaf syndrome, syndrome, which is spontaneous rupture. You usually find them in uh, someone who's been uh, trying to uh, force themselves to vomit. Uh, the pain is characterized as it's a pain in the chest. Uh, goes to the back, the abdomen, it's sudden onset, uh, it's behind the sternum and it, it gets worsened by trying to swallow or moving the neck uh, and as we said might follow forceful vomiting. Uh, on examination they look ill, they're uh, tachycardic, they might have a fever, a little bit short of breath, uh, a little bit clammy, uh, if you feel around the neck and the chest, you might feel a bit of surgical emphysema there. Uh, if it happened uh, a little bit earlier, you might find the abdomen uh, to be rigid. They might be hypotensive. With investigations, uh, make sure you get an ECG. You notice that the ECG should be normal or there's nothing acute on the ECG. Uh, the chest x-ray, you might notice a pneumomediastinum. Uh, you can see it around here, which is a little bit of air separating the, the heart from the uh, pericardium. Uh, there might be a little bit of left side pleural effusion. You might notice some surgical emphysema uh, on the x-ray. How do we manage? Again, we get IV axis. Uh, we fluid resuscitate, give IV antibiotics straight away, uh, analgesia, and again, get the surgeons uh, and the cardiothoracics involved as early as possible. Another uh, group of causes for chest pain is the musculoskeletal chest pain. Uh, so uh, this is often there presents but um, we should always look for uh, the more serious ones rather than settle for a, an easy way out with a diagnosis of musculoskeletal chest pain. So this happens due to irritation or inflammation of the structures in the chest wall. Uh, it could be uh, uh, costochondritis uh, or zycodemia, intercostal strain, uh, secondary to cough, uh, pectoralis muscle pain, secondary to uh, heavy lifting or physical exertion. Um, they usually present with sharp chest pain, worsened by movement, they're tender on palpation. But again, do not exclude the other causes just because the patient is tender on palpation. Um, Another cause that might be a little bit uh, difficult if presented to the department early would be uh, the herpes zoster or shingles. Uh, this usually occurs in the elderly. It's dermatomal in distribution. Diagnosis is usually difficult if they present early, so the first one to four days. Um, then you'd notice the erythema, the physicals and the crustaceans happening and that's what makes it easy to diagnose. It's usually unilateral, affects one to two dermatomes, 
you give analgesia if they present early, make sure you give antivirals, it's uh, cyclovir 800 milligrams uh, five times a day for uh, seven days. Thank you.